the negative cancer group. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. Because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. We have a special guest tonight, so we ask that you all stay muted during the presentation. And when we have, when um, our guest finishes the presentation, we'll have Q and A time. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'll put a little note in the chat so you guys can all see exactly where that is. Um, this presentation will be recorded. So I will note that if you speak up during the presentation, um, which Chrissy says that you're welcome to do, our guest welcomes you to do that, just know that you will be um, shown on camera if you speak up. So just to note um, the way that Zoom works, if you speak, you will, you will show up on camera. Um, so I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Christy Spears. Christy received her Master of Science in Genetic Counseling from the Ohio State University. She works at OSU as an assistant professor where she helps run the high-risk breast cancer clinic as a genetic counselor. She also aids in surgical decision-making, genetic counseling for individuals newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Christy is passionate about oncology research and did her master's thesis on prostate cancer and polygenetic risk scores. She is currently a part of the Know Your Risk study at OSU, which focuses on breast cancer and polygenetic risk scores. Christy, thank you so much for joining us. I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Nancy. Thanks, everyone, uh, for having me today. I'm excited to speak with you all. So let me get my screen shared here. All right. So I just first wanted to start out by addressing what exactly is triple negative breast cancer. So we all have these three different receptors. So estrogen, progesterone, there are two types of receptors that can be on breast cancer cells. And then we have this HER2, which is actually a protein as well. So as you can see in this picture here, most of these breast cancer cells, they have these three receptors. And if we have estrogen or progesterone that our body naturally makes, those estrogen and progesterone, they bind to those receptors of the breast cancer cells. And typically they can cause those to divide and spread quickly and it's what's feeding the breast cancer cells. This HER2 protein and HER2 positive patients, they have an overexpression of this protein, which is causing, again, those cancer cells to divide more quickly and grow. So in individuals that have triple negative breast cancer, what that means is all three of those receptors are lacking on that breast cancer cell. So we don't have estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 that's feeding that breast cancer. So what that means is individuals that are ERPR or estrogen progesterone positive, they have certain treatments that block those receptors, or there are treatments for HER2 positive patients that can block that overexpression of that HER2 protein. So that's why it really limits individuals that have triple negative breast cancer, because we can't use any of those remedies that we can for people that are positive. And that's why it can be harder to treat. And typically, you know, treatment is surgery or chemotherapy. So what we know about triple negative breast cancer, as far as genetics goes, is that it does encompass 10 to 15% of all breast cancers. And we see it in higher rates in African-American women, individuals that are diagnosed younger than the age of 40, and specifically with genetics is what I'm here to talk to you all about is that we do see a higher mutation rate or genetic mutation rate um, in individuals that have triple negative breast cancer. So what is genetic counseling? If you've never met with a genetic counselor before, what my job is, is to review your personal history of cancer. So typically we start out with how old you were when you were diagnosed. And then we would go over and collect your family history, which I'll show you an example of what I do. So we pretty much draw out your family tree. So it's something that's called a pedigree and things that we're looking for. We wanna know who in the family's had cancer, but also who doesn't have cancer in your family. So, and we use this tool as a way to assess if we think there's a higher chance for a mutation that's in the family. So some of the things that we look for are younger ages of diagnosis. So typically younger than the age of 50 meets our testing criteria. 
We also look for multiple generations of individuals that are diagnosed with breast cancers or some linking cancers like ovarian cancer, which is a more rare cancer than breast cancer or prostate cancer in men. So just to point out that sometimes these mutations, some people think it can only affect women. It can also affect men as well. What we do is we discuss the different testing options and how it could impact your management or your treatment moving forward. So I do see a lot of women that were just newly diagnosed within the past week, and they may be weighing if they want to do a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. And knowing the results of your genetic testing could help impact that decision. We also discuss the impact of family members. So I'll discuss the inheritance pattern of these genetic mutations. These are what we call autosomal dominant, and what that means is that if you were to test positive, each of your family members, your first degree family members would have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the same genetic mutation. And it's possible that they could be at an increased risk for cancer too, and it could impact their management and screening recommendations as well. We also discussed the cost of testing. So we never want cost to be the reason that someone doesn't pursue genetic testing. It has come down majorly in the past 10 years. It used to be thousands of dollars max $250 out of pocket is what it is now. Um, of course, it runs through insurance. It depends on what your insurance and which lab you use. But um, typically what I tell my patients is max $250. And then even after the testing, so after meeting with me, results typically take three to four weeks to get your results. And I give you a phone call or if you want to meet in person to discuss your results, that's when I go over what your results are, how your screening management could change and then refer you to any necessary providers that you might need besides breast cancer screening. So in a nutshell, that's what I do every day for women that are diagnosed with breast cancer and even people that don't have a, have a personal history but might just have a family history and wanna know um, if their genetic testing is positive or not. So just to explain a little bit of how the testing is done. So we all have these genes and it's in our DNA. So you can think of our DNA as our body's instruction manual. They're telling us how to grow and function properly. So we all have genes that make up our hair color, make up our eye color, but we also have cancer genes. And I like to call them our cancer protector genes. So we all want these genes and we have two copies of every gene, one that we get from our mom and one that we get from our dad. And we want them to be, be functioning properly and they're supposed to be protecting us from cancer. So what we're looking for when we do this DNA testing is to see if any of those cancer protecting genes aren't functioning properly. So there might be a spelling mistake in that instruction manual that's causing that gene not to function, and then it's not protecting us as well from cancer. So with the testing, there's a couple of different options that we do. We can do a blood draw typically when my patients are seen in person. And, or if you are wanting to do a telehealth, if it's hard for transportation, you live in a rural area, not close, a lot of places do have telehealth options now. So either just by phone call or video call. And a lot of the test sites that we use, they can send a saliva kit directly to your house. It's just like one of those ancestry kits. If you've ever done one of those at home, you just have to spit into a tube. Um, and it's, you know, you just can't eat or drink anything for 30 minutes. So talking about the testing is always, harder than doing actual testing is what I say. So we send it off to the lab and then in three to four weeks, we would be able to get those in results and interpret them for you. So another reason that we do that family history and look for those different signs and symptoms is because there can be different categories of cancer. And what I mean by that is about 65% of the time you can see in this pie chart, Breast cancer, it just happens sporadically. We don't know what caused it. It could be environmental, it could be lifestyle factors, or it could be a combination of multiple genes that are increasing your cancer risk. So it's not always a single genetic mutation that can cause it. So actually we only find a single genetic mutation in about five to 10% of individuals. And that's just all different types of cancer. When we think about triple negative breast cancer specifically, that number is about 15%. Um, of individuals with triple negative cancer will test positive. So it is a higher rate when we see individuals with that specific type of breast cancer. Some studies that have looked at this, again, there are smaller population sizes, only a couple hundred women, they find up to 30% of women might test positive for a mutation. So of course, we use the, that family history to kind of guide us of who we think might test positive, but we never actually know who that five to 10% of people are until we actually do the testing. 
So you can see in the middle here between just that sporadic cancer or that hereditary cancer, sometimes we can label it as familial cancer. And what I mean by that is that maybe there is a striking family history of cancer. You know, your mom might've had cancer and your aunt and you and your sister. If your genetics comes back negative, there still is an increased cancer risk in your family. That just means we didn't identify the genetic cause. And what we think when we see families like that is that it's familial and there's probably a lot more genes that are contributing to your breast cancer risk and not a single mutation that we tested for. Can I interrupt you just um, for a minute? So hereditary shows, just so that I'm clear, shows that there's a very specific gene that's causing the cancer, but familial means there's probably a, several that are, is that what, is that right? Yep. So um, this just went into it a little bit further too. So when we oh, think okay. of hereditary, that's what we think of. And I was going to give an example too in a, in a further slide. So like BRCA1 and 2 or BRCA1 and 2 is what we consider hereditary. That means there's a single genetic change that you can pass on to your children and your other relatives are at risk for that single change. We know what the cancer risks are and we know how to treat you. Say you still have that striking family history, like it says here, there's multiple relatives with the same types of cancer. Um, we think there's multiple different genes that could be playing a factor. So we, we don't know how to test for that right now. So that's what some of the research studies that I do and what my thesis was on. And that's what these polygenic risk scores are. So this is, instead of looking at one gene, we're looking at maybe 70 different places within your DNA that could be associated with increased breast cancer risk. And we're adding those 70 different spots together to get one risk score. So that is what a lot of the research is doing now is focusing on these individuals that test negative. We're trying to figure out the reason why, because there definitely is something that, you know, looks suspicious or is going on in the family. Well, and along those lines, um, we did have a question show up just yeah. um, that uh, somebody is asking, she said that her genetic tests were negative. Hmm. Um, does it, is it safe to assume that her sisters would also be negative if they have the same, since they have the same mother and father? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so it kind of depends. It's still possible that your sister might have a mutation that maybe you didn't inherit if she has a history of cancer, like ovarian cancer, or she has a history of breast cancer herself, then she could still consider testing for herself because you get one copy of a gene from mom, one copy of a gene from dad. It's possible that maybe, you know, mom or dad pass on a mutation to your sister that just you didn't inherit. So it's not a 0% chance, but if your sister didn't have a history of cancer and, you know, you're the only one in the family, that could be reassuring to your sister then. So it really just depends on what her personal history is and the additional family history. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, with hereditary cancer, what we're seeing is those earlier ages of onset, so younger than the age of 50, um, and, and those multiple generations in the family. Whereas sporadic cancer, we think it's more diagnosis of individuals in their 60s or 70s. And, and it's tricky because we know one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So it rounds to about 12%. So again, not all women will test positive for one of these mutations. So these are the, what's called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines. And this is what I use and us as genetic counselors use to see who quote unquote meets criteria to do genetic testing. So I will say, even if an individual doesn't meet this specific testing criteria, I'm so happy to test anyone because like I said, just because you don't meet our testing criteria doesn't always mean that there's not a mutation that's in the family. This just helps us guide who we think is more suspicious or more likely to test positive. So these are for uh, the year 2023. They actually were just released last month. So for individuals that have a personal history of cancer, again, that younger than the age of 50 is kind of a magic number for us in genetics. Um, but at any age, you can see the pathology, triple negative breast cancer automatically meets criteria. So if any of you on this phone call want to do genetic testing, you automatically meet what our testing criteria is. And this is what insurance looks at to decide if they want to cover the testing or not. And, but I always say just because insurance might cover the testing, it just doesn't, doesn't always equal no bill. But again, this is what insurance will look at, the NCCN guidelines. Um, some other factors are lobular breast cancer, automatic genetic testing criteria, or if you've been diagnosed with multiple primary breast cancers. 
So what the synchronous or metasynchronous means here. So synchronous means that you have it at the same time. So you have it on both breasts. So you were diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer or metas uh, metasynchronous. So maybe you were diagnosed on your left breast. Five years later, you were re-diagnosed on your right breast. So these are two different primary cancers. What we don't consider to be multiple primary cancers are if there's a recurrence. And what that means is maybe you went through treatment and it was just on your right breast, you had treatment, but it recurred and it came back. If it's still that triple negative breast cancer, we wouldn't consider that another primary cancer. We would just say that that was the original cancer that came back and recurred, if that makes sense. Um, for people that don't have a family history of cancer, again, we have testing criteria for family history here. So if you have one or more close blood relative, again, that was diagnosed with breast cancer at age younger than 50. So say, you know, your daughter wants to do testing and you're not interested in doing testing for yourself. It's still, your daughter could still come in and do testing um, if you weren't interested in knowing that information for yourself. Some other things that we look for are male breast cancer. So again, some people think that breast cancer can only affect women. It's not as common, nearly as common in, in men, but that is a more rare cancer. So that's when we think maybe there's a mutation that caused that male breast cancer. Ovarian, if you have a family history of ovarian or pancreatic cancer, again, that also those two types of cancer make us more suspicious that there is a mutation within the family, as well as some specific types of prostate cancer. We can see all of those cancers running together in families with these mutations. So to give you an example, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are the most common genes that come back positive when we test women with triple negative breast cancer. So they all have the same types of cancer risks. So BRCA1 and 2, it's just the per lifetime percentages vary a little bit differently. So I just picked BRCA2 to give you a specific example. Um, so if you were to test positive, what this means is we know that females have a 50 to 85% lifetime chance to develop breast cancer. So I know everyone here has already developed breast cancer. So what that means is we know there's a higher chance for a second primary breast cancer as well. And typically we quote that to be about a 30% chance within a 15 year range if you test positive. Like I said, males who have breast tissue, they also can get mammograms. They don't have nearly as high as that lifetime chance. So it's about two to 7% lifetime chance. Other cancers that we can see are pancreatic cancer with a five to 10% lifetime chance. Ovarian cancer is about 10 to 30% lifetime chance and prostate cancer in men, 20 to 60% lifetime chance. We also can see melanoma. We say this number is increased. There still needs to be a little bit more data shown. So we, so we don't exactly put a number on there, but what this means for you if you were to test positive. So I'll talk about a little bit about how your treatment could change. So to address the breast cancer risk, some individuals, like I said, during their surgery decisions, they may opt to do bilateral mastectomies, even if breast cancer is just on one of their breasts. And the reason for that is because of that higher chance for breast cancer to occur on the other breast. Surgery isn't for everyone. So there is increased surveillance that individuals could do. So what that could look like would be instead of doing breast MRI or just an annual mammogram, they might opt to do a breast MRI in addition. And again, for individuals that don't have a history of cancer, we recommend starting earlier. So around, we say 10 years earlier than the earliest diagnosis in the family, but not before age 30. So starting at age 30, if you have a daughter, you know, she could start her breast imaging earlier than the general population at age 40. Um, for pancreatic cancer, we don't have great screening like we do for breast cancer. But what that looks like is an endoscopy where it does go down to your throat and they use an ultrasound to look at the pancreas. The other cancer risk, ovarian cancer. Again, we don't have great ovarian cancer screening like we do for breast cancer. And that is something that is currently being looked into to try to increase options because right now the only recommendation is to remove the ovaries. So I know that can be a big decision too, especially if you haven't been through menopause because taking out your ovaries automatically puts someone through menopause. Or, you know, we want women to have that option to have children too, if they want to do that. So we typically say after childbearing years, it's not something that you have to do right away, you know, in your twenties or thirties, but um, either after menopause or after those childbearing years is when that's recommended. And then for prostate cancer screening, we don't necessarily recommend anything different than what we do for the general population. That would be PSA testing and digital rectal exams for men starting at age 40. And melanoma, 
every it's the same recommendations that we recommend for the general population. So staying out of the sun, using your sunscreen, don't use tanning beds, um, all of those good things. Chrissy, while we're talking about BRCA2, um, mm -hmm. uh, there is a question that came in. Do males have an increased risk of any other types of cancers outside of prostate cancer with BRCA2? So they have the, chance, uh, the increased risk for pancreatic cancer as well. And there is male breast cancer risk. So on here, you can see it's about two to 7%. So again, not nearly as high as 85% as it is for females. So if, they, if men do have um, increased breast tissue, they can get mammograms as well. Typically we say that starts at age 50 for men because again, that lifetime risk isn't quite as high for females. And is there other screening for men outside of mammograms if, just the, if they can't get a mammogram? We say self breast exams. Again, mm -hmm. it's the same that we do. We, we say for women, you know, starting at age 18 is what we recommend to do your self breast exam when you're in the shower, when you're getting ready and also to see um, I know for females, when we go see our OBGYN, they usually do a breast exam for us by, so either, you know, getting set up in a high-risk clinic that can do a self-exam for them as well. Okay. Any other questions about BRCA2? I know I'm throwing a lot of information at all of you, so I'll take a pause for a second to see if any other questions come in so far. Yeah, and you're welcome to speak up. Just a reminder um, that you will be on camera if you do, but feel free to, to speak up if you'd like. Well, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned um, ovarian, or having your ovaries removed post-menopause. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so you said you recommend that women do that? If they test positive for a mutation and specifically BRCA1 and, or BRCA2, that is what the recommendation is, is to remove the ovaries. Uh -huh. And that's just because we don't have any really screening options that are great right now, like we do for breast cancer. So what if you don't test positive, then what? If you don't test positive, we don't recommend removing the ovaries with lack of family history um, or rent. You know, if, if, if there's a striking family history, say of ovarian cancer and you still tested negative, some, some doctors and surgeons may consider doing that for you, but typically you know, if there's only one person in the family that's had ovarian cancer, um, we don't recommend removing the ovaries. It is a big, big decision in surgery to go through. And even people, you know, that test positive may not want to go through that surgery either. Okay. I, I have a question about genetic testing. I was, um, I'm two years into recovery. Um, I was diagnosed as HER2 positive um, went through bridge chemo because of COVID and didn't have surgery for nine months. And I came out of the operating room, triple negative. Um, genetic testing was never offered to me. I have no family history of cancer. Um, is it wise for me to go ahead and, and get the testing? I would say if if you're triple negative, again, you meet our testing criteria, even without family history, because that is a good point to make. Even people that test positive for BRCA2, sometimes they, they, it's not a guarantee that you will develop breast cancer. And the other thing is too, there could be a mutation that's coming, say, from your dad's side of the family. And sometimes these BRCA mutations are hidden if you have a lot of men in your family, because they aren't at that increased risk for you know ovarian cancer or breast cancer. So sometimes these mutations can be hidden and like I said, we don't know who those five to 10% 10 per, 10 of people are that are going to be positive. So if you want testing, I definitely think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it would be for the benefit of others in the family, like my sister. For your Yes, for your sister, um, if you have children, to know for them too. Um, and to so that we could uh, survey you for other types of cancer too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, Leslie, I do have, you have a, a question. Yes, yes, I do. Hi, um, I was, um, my um, son-in-law is BRCA2 positive mm -hmm. and they're thinking of having um, some babies. Mm -hmm. And I, that means that they would have 50% chance of the babies carrying this because his twin brother actually had four children without, you know, testing or anything. And my daughter is thinking of doing in vitro. Mm -hmm. Okay, to select. Yeah, so that is an option. Is that what you're wondering if that's? Yes, 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 mm -hmm. that, that is an option, right? 
Yep. So in vitro fertilization, and then they can do what we call pre-implantation genetic testing. So they can test the embryos to see which ones have the BRCA2 mutation and which ones don't, and they can implant the embryos that don't have the mutation. Do you know if there's a limit on implantations at this point? Um, vitro? I'm, yeah, it keeps changing. I wasn't sure if you knew. No, that is not my okay. area of specialty, so okay. I apologize. Okay, no problem. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Jackie, go ahead. You're on mute, Jackie. Sorry. Um, I have a similar question to Carol. I was diagnosed two years ago, mm -hmm. um, 55, and I was told because of my age and I don't have immediate family, um, like a mother or a sister that mm -hmm. I don't need. I have a brother who died with colon cancer, first cousin who died with breast cancer, and some other third, fourth cousin. Um, should I still persist in having the genetic test? Yeah, like I said, you meet criteria just based on your own personal diagnosis. Okay. So if you want that information for yourself, I definitely think it's worth pursuing even without that family history. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Chrissy, we've got one more um, yeah. that I'll ask just to, since we're, um, since we're in the middle. So yeah. if one is stage zero, had a lumpectomy and radiation, is it mm -hmm. recommended that I be tested if I had two relatives with other cancers diagnosed after the age of 62? I'm 62 now. Okay. Was it still triple negative breast cancer at stage zero? I do well, not know. So typically if, if it's, I'm assuming it's, D, was it DCIS, ductal carcinoma in site two? So there's a couple of questions yeah. that I need answered before I can yeah, yeah. confidently answer that. Um, but again, that's something that, so what, what I would say, again, anyone that has triple negative breast cancer meets our criteria. Typically, if it's DCIS, they don't actually do the HER2 testing. They only do estrogen and progesterone. So they it would be hard to say it's triple negative if it was just DCIS, um, which is why I'm kind of hesitating with that question. But like I said, I mean, even if you don't meet criteria and anyone once testing, I'm pro knowledge is power. And if that's information that you want, I think it's worth doing. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask the other questions just a little bit later. Um, so you can keep going. I want to make sure you get through your presentation. Um, yeah. but I think we'll have uh, a lot more yeah. questions here at the end. Okay. Yeah. And some of these questions, some of the additional slides might answer what other questions you guys Perfect. have. Okay. So, um, where I was going, we, we say this two hit hypothesis. So just to show you why, if you were to test positive for, genetic, for a genetic mutation, why you have that increased cancer risk. So in the blue here, this shows an individual who does not carry a mutation. So they have two of these blue genes or chromosomes. In order to get cancer, both of these genes have to stop functioning properly. So say these are both the BRCA2 gene. You got this one from mom and you got this one from dad. As our cells are constantly dividing and replicating, sometimes a mistake can occur. So we get one, what we call acquired mutation. It just happens during our lifetime and age is the biggest risk factor. So you still have that other BRCA2 gene that's functioning properly, it's doing its job. Um, but over time, again, say in another five to 10 years, that second BRCA2 gene, it stops functioning. That's when we develop cancer is when both copies of those genes stop working. So individuals, that carry a mutation, this means that you were born with the mutation. So every cell in your body has one working copy of that BRCA2 gene and one non-working copy of that BRCA2 gene. So you can see it's easier. There's one less step that needs to occur before cancer develops because you were already born with one copy not working. So then that's why we see those earlier ages of diagnosis and you just need one more hit is what we call it. So that's why we call it the two hit hypothesis. So this just shows what the inheritance pattern is. So again, we get one of our genes from our mom and one of our genes from our dad. So this just shows this mother, she has a mutation. She has a 50% chance of passing on this mutation. She has a 50% chance of passing on her working copy or her working BRCA2 gene. So that just shows the 50-50 chance of this inheritance pattern. So you can see half of her children, well, it's a flip of a coin, what we say with each pregnancy. So it doesn't necessarily mean if you have four kids, two of them will be positive and two of them won't. But with each pregnancy, there's that 50-50 chance 
that your child could inherit a mutation, a 50-50 chance, they would inherit that working copy of the gene. And then this is the word that we use, it's called pedigree or your family tree. This is just to give you an idea of what a BRCA2 family could look like. So we see these younger ages of diagnosis, breast cancer diagnosed in their 50s. And this, so squares represent men and circles represent females is how we, we draw these. So you can see breast cancer in this man, red flag um, for a mutation. We also can see that pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and prostate cancer. And you can see this is all on the same side of the family. So say, you know, if there was one person with ovarian cancer on mom's side, there was another family history of cancer, of breast cancer, you know, at 65 on the other side of the family. That just says, I'm just trying to explain that we look at each side of the family individually. So we want to look at mom's side of the family. And we also want to look at dad's side of the family since half of your DNA is from mom, half of your DNA is from dad. They don't add together. So you don't, you want to add an ovarian cancer risk for mom and a breast cancer risk from dad and add those two together since they're different sides of the family. And then this is just to show you, there are other breast cancer genes besides just BRCA1 and 2. I won't read them all. They all are just a bunch of different letters and numbers together. Um, they each have different cancer risks. So I know, again, I use that BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation um, to just as an example. But for instance, some of these genes, they can't have increased colon cancer risk. And in that case, what the recommendation is, is to increase the frequency of your colonoscopies. Um, and some, you know, have higher cancer risk than others. So that lifetime percentage can change like it does between BRCA1 and 2. The other thing that I'll mention, say, if you did have genetic testing before, um, before 2013, they were only doing testing for BRCA1 and 2. So you may be qualified to do updated testing because now we know a lot more of these breast cancer genes that can increase your breast cancer risk. So Oh, sorry, was there a question? Can you say that year one more time before 2013? Is that what you said? Yep, we say 2013, 2014, because typically they, they were only doing BRCA1 and 2. And even then they weren't, the technology has increased because there's still a five, we say that testing before 2013 still missed five to 10% of BRCA1 and 2 mutations because we have new technology that can look at different areas within that gene and detect more mutations. And this big, so now what is standard is to do a big panel like this. So um, yes, updated testing can be pursued. Some people think, you know, genetic testing is a once in a lifetime thing, but we are constantly learning and it is possible that we'll find a new gene, you know, five to 10 years down the line that we do want to pursue additional testing as well. So just to keep that on your radar as well. So if you're wondering, I know we had a lot of questions specifically, should I pursue genetic testing? Um, what things to look out for? These are specific questions to ask your family. And I know it sounds silly, but I know the holidays are coming up and I know this isn't a fun topic of conversation, but if you're getting together for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, you know, you can ask these questions. I know a lot of, I have a lot of people that come in and say, oh, well, my grandma had some cancer, but she kept it a secret. So this is your opportunity to ask questions and learn information because like I said, I come from a knowledge is power. And I didn't know the answer to these questions until my mom got diagnosed herself. So, you know, and then I started, looking into it a little bit more. And, you know, she's the reason that I got into this. But so things to look for are those sp specific types of cancer. So pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, those are the more rare cancers, those ages of diagnosis. If you're diagnosed, you know, in 60s, 70s, 80s, we don't think that's nearly as, you know, as much of a red flag if someone's diagnosed in their 30s, 40s, or 50s. Also things to keep in mind are, is this coming from your mom's side of the family or your dad's side of the the family again because those two things they don't add together so you want to know if there's a lot of cancer on moms or on dads and keep them separate when you're assessing your your risk the other thing to know is your ethnicity specifically ashkenazi jewish ancestry we say that there's a higher chance to have a brca1 or two mutation if you're ashkenazi jewish so we say that one in 40 people of ashkenazi jewish ancestry test positive whereas the general population is one in 400 so your chance of having a mutation is higher if you have that ancestry. And the reason for that is because Ashkenazi, sorry, Jewish ancestry, um, they tended to stay in one area and they just kept populating 
So that is why there's a higher rate of these BRCA1 and 2 mutations of what we call these founder mutations. Um, and another thing to mention too, oh, we have another question. Yeah, so just um, out of curiosity, so with the Ashkenazi Jewish population, does that mean that both the mother and father had the genetic mutation? It, so it could come from either mom or dad. It's just there's a higher chance either the mom has it or the dad has it. So if they're both Ashkenazi Jewish, there'd be a one in 40 chance that dad has it. There'd be a one in 40 chance that mom had the mutation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the general population of non-Ashkenazi Jewish is one in 400. And again, that's just because they all tended to stay in one area. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is some people will come in and tell me that they had negative BRCA1 and 2 testing through 23andMe. And what we say about that, that's a direct, direct to consumer testing. And we say that's more of a fun test to do. Um, it's definitely interesting, and I won't lie, I've done it myself, but if you're looking to know if you're at an increased risk for these cancer genes, it only looks for the three Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutations in BRCA1 and 2. So it can provide this false sense of security when people come in and tell me they tested negative, and that's good, you know, if you're Ashkenazi Jewish because you tested negative for those three mutations, but there are thousands of mutations in the BRCA1 and 2 gene. And as I showed you on that list, there are additional genes that 23andMe doesn't test for. So if you tested negative for 23andMe, you know, that's great. There's additional testing that you could still pursue. Um, another question to ask is, has anyone had genetic testing? So again, important information to know if you, if someone has tested positive, it's really helpful for me when people come in with a copy of their family member's report, because that lets me know the specific mutation that we want to test for. And, you know, I want to be able to confidently tell you if you tested positive or negative for that specific mutation and make sure that we weren't missing something. So just some considerations for thoughts for testing. There definitely are pros and cons, like there are everything. So pros to doing the testing is it potentially could find an explanation for why you developed cancer. Some people find peace in knowing that information, and some people just want this knowledge for their family members. So even if it won't affect your current treatment, you know, you've, you've been out of, you've been in remission for years, it still could be knowledge for your children, for your siblings, because if they're in their 20s or 30s, they might initiate their screening earlier rather than later. And what we focus on for people that don't have cancer is initiating that um, prevention and catching cancer from happening early. The other pro, again, like I said, is to take action. So could affect your management or your treatment moving forward. And then another pro that I wanted to point out is this, we have a law that's in place, it's called GINA. So this stands for the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And essentially people come in and they wonder if you were to test positive, could this be used against you? for life insurance or employment? And the short answer to that is no. So again, this law, if you can't lose your health insurance, you can't get fired from a job, you can't get declined a job if you were to test positive. So it prevents that. However, if you see on the cons list in the second point, things that the law doesn't protect are things that you have to opt into. So things like life insurance, long-term care, and long-term disability. So. If you've had a history of cancer, it can be hard to get life insurance anyway, but this is more for you know children who haven't had a history of cancer and maybe be in their 20s and haven't thought about this. It's not that necessarily life insurance is seeking out this information, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind because if they were to go up a policy, you know, legally they could get denied or they could be charged a higher premium if they are positive. Another con is the cost of testing. So again, it's not thousands of dollars, but that max 250, I know can be a different number to everyone and that still is expensive. A lot of the times the labs, um, they'll have a financial assistance program that you could apply for and it is pretty generous. So like I said, we never want the cost of testing to be the reason someone doesn't pursue genetic testing if they want it. So I work with my patients to try to get as much covered as possible. Another con is just emotions that go into this. It can be hard to know that you're positive and might pass this on to children. I have a lot of people that tell me they feel guilty and you know it can be hard, hard to know that information, but it's definitely, you know, I just try to reassure you it's not your fault. And you know, there are steps that we can do to prevent cancer from happening in future generations. The last point that I wanted to touch on um, is this uncertainty. 
So I know we talked about there's a positive result. Over 90% of the time, the test results come back negative and it won't change your medical management or treatment moving forward. It just means we ident identify the cause of your cancer, the family history. But sometimes we can get this third result that's called a variant of uncertain significance. And this means we identified a change in one of your genes, but we don't have enough information to say if it's associated with increased cancer risk or not. We all have differences in our DNA because we're all different. We all look different. We all act different. Most of the time, these uncertain results, they're not causing any problems. So we treat them like they're a negative result if we get this. But I know sometimes getting this uncertain result can cause someone to worry. Um, but most of the time, they get downgraded to be nothing or non benign, non cancerous. But I know even just getting one of those VUSs can be hard to hear. So this is just information. I can keep this up. This is how to find a genetic counselor in your area. This website here, findageneticcounselor.nsgc.org. So NSGC stands for the National Society of Genetic Counselors. And you can type in that address, um, click find a genetic counselor and put in your zip code. And it'll come up with genetic counselors that take in-person telehealth visits, um, whatever is most convenient for you. Another great place to go is this genomedical.com. They're an all telehealth company too that does it all, all over the United States. So I will leave. I think my last slide is just a question slide. That's all the information that I had planned for you, but I know we probably have a lot of questions. Um, but I have my email too. If you want to email me directly, put it in the chat. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions right now, but I'll just leave this slide up for now. So, well, thank you. Yeah, we do have a few questions. Um, and then please feel free to either speak up or put them in the chat. Um, so I'll start with this one, Christy. Um, genetic results were negative. However, my bilateral, I think BX stands for bilateral mastectomy, showed LCI, an LCIS component. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, sorry. I missed. Okay. Genetic results were negative, but my pathology showed an LCIS component when I had my lumpectomy for triple negative. Have you seen patients with this combination? I'm always curious of the population as I'm aware it elevates risk and if there is a genetic predisposition with this population. Okay. So if I understand, did you, so there was LCIS that was found during surgery with, a, with a lumpectomy. With the yeah. lumpectomy. With, okay. Yes. Okay, and now that was triple negative. Did you have another breast cancer diagnosis before that? Triple negative. Okay, and that was just lobular? Um, uh, or was it just LCIS? No, it was LCIS with okay. the triple negative. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so yes, we do see that. From a genetic standpoint, it can be... It can be kind of complicated to explain, but from genetics, we actually don't consider lobular carcinoma in situ to be testing criteria. You look like it looks like you're shaking your head in, in agreement. So we don't consider that to be cancer from a genetics perspective, where we do consider ductal carcinoma in situ to be cancer from a genetic perspective. So LCIS yeah. is more, yep. It looks like you're, or someone might have told you that before too. So yes, having LCIS with triple negative doesn't necessarily meet our testing criteria because we don't consider it to be. Okay. Okay. I just wondered with that population, if, if you were advancing that or not, just with the two of them combined. Yeah. And, with the and triple it, negative and the LCIS. Right. So, um, I mean, it, it is a risk factor though, but yes, from a genetic standpoint, we don't recommend okay, testing for LCIS triple negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chrissy, you mentioned that people who were tested pre 2013, 2014 mm -hmm. should consider um, having testing done again. Is there any other kind of time frame? Should people consider getting updated genetic testing at, at any other point in time as well? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> and that's just because I don't know when the genetics is going to change. Um, I will say that the NCCN guidelines, that National Cancer Comprehensive Network guidelines that I showed you on a previous slide, those get updated every year. And I will say they do make changes every year, but they're usually small changes. And what I mean by that is maybe instead of 
BRCA2, they said there's a 60 to 85% lifetime chance. Maybe they'll change that lifetime chance to 65 to 85%. So right now there is no new gene that I know of. It's actually working in the opposite way. It's more, we thought this gene was associated with breast cancer risk and we're actually thinking it's not anymore. Interesting. So your genetic test results, I think it's worth checking in if you've met with a genetic counselor, maybe every year or two years, just to check if for a couple of reasons. If you had one of those uncertain results, I keep track of all of them myself, but I can't say that for every other genetic counselor as well, but you may just want to call them and see if that uncertain result has reclassified one way or the other. Um, or yeah, if, if there is new knowledge since you've gotten tested, but I can't say, you know, do genetic testing every five years, every 10 years. It really just depends on what information comes out. Yeah. But as, as long as I've been doing it and the, for the past, you know, five, I'm, I know I'm kind of fresh to the field, but um, I've been involved in genetics for the past five years and there hasn't been like a new gene that has come out okay. to, to pursue additional genetic testing. Um, for breast cancer specifically, what we look for when I look at patients that have had testing a couple of years ago, I look for nine specific breast cancer genes. So if you know the size of your panel, if you at least have these nine if you have your test report, I would look to see at the top of your test report, what panel you had, if you had a breast and gynecological cancers panel, um, if you have those nine breast cancer genes, I think that, you know, that's, that's good for the breast cancer specifically. Um, so I have a question of my own. Um, so I was diagnosed with triple negative at the age of 33 mm -hmm. in 2015, and I had two grandmothers with, um, with breast cancer, you know, late, late into their 60s it was kind of the harbinger of bad news as far as being diagnosed really young. And since my diagnosis, my mom has been diagnosed with breast cancer. My dad has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. I've got a son, I've got two brothers, I've got nieces. So like how deep should other family members go on testing because there is such a strong familial link now there there wasn't always but since my diagnosis there there really has been mm -hmm. yeah again that's another tough question to answer um if so if you tested negative there's nothing that we know of right now that you can pass on to your kids so addressing that with your children unless they have a strong family history of cancer on their dad's side of the family you know, your spouse could consider doing testing for himself too. If he's negative, nothing to pass on to kids. With your mom and dad too, typically we recommend testing people that are affected. So it's not that we recommend testing everyone in the family. We want to focus on the people who are affected. So if your mom's had a personal history of breast cancer, she could pursue testing, you know, um, but you were the, the youngest diagnosis, you know, so with your negative testing, it's unlikely to find something else in the family because we would assume that if there was, you would have inherited it. Sure. So it's not a 0% chance, but it makes it more unlikely that there's something in the family, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it does. yeah. Um, okay. So I have another question in the chat. Um, so you mentioned genetic counseling impacting surgical decisions when you were talking about, um, uh, oh, you know, removal of ovaries. Mm -hmm. Do genetics impact other types of treatment as well? Like decisions on chemo, types of chemo, that kind of stuff. Is that something that you've touched on during your um, career? Yeah. So that's a good question too. Um, I do opt a lot of, I field a lot of those questions to your oncologist though. I'm not a doctor. So as far as if you should undergo chemo or, you know, what those decisions are for your treatment, I do defer to a doctor. What I can say about BRCA1 and 2 specifically is that if you do test positive for one of those two genes, you can um, make possibly qualify for what we call a PARP inhibitor. So that is one way that genetics could influence um, mm -hmm. your treatment moving forward, but not everyone that has triple negative breast cancer and is BRCA positive will qualify for PARP inhibitors. So that's why I defer to doctors as well, but it can help. It, it's something that has been research too recently um, that can't help a lot that we're finding these PARP inhibitors. Okay, got it. Yeah, so I apologize. That's not my area of expertise. No, of course, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Judy, you mentioned that you have a question. Yes, uh, to, to, to kind of add to the first question about the testing negative and whether or not my sister's 
should also have the test. Um, um, basically, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1995. Back in the day, they didn't know how to do the different type of breast cancers back then. So I don't know what kind she had. Mm -hmm. But my our older sister had endometrial cancer. Uh, she passed away from it in 2019. And eight years prior to that, uh, she had uh, melanoma. And so based on more information, uh, I know those cancers probably are not linked, endometria and possibly melanoma. Um, should my sister get the test? So just based on that history, again, I'd want to know, you know, ages of diagnosis. Um, and again, if your testing came back negative, it might make it more unlikely that, that she could have something, but it's not 0%. The, what we see with endometrial cancer, typically the cancers that run together are endometrial and colon cancer. And that those are associated with a condition that's called Lynch syndrome. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but that's where we're seeing, um, people diagnosed with colon cancer under the age of 50 or lots of colon polyps in the family, um, where we can't see that uterine cancer as well. And, and there is a little bit elevated risk of breast cancer, but the Lynch syndrome isn't nearly associated with breast cancer. Like we think BRCA1 and BRCA2 are. So that's a long-winded answer of saying she still could consider it for herself, but with your negative testing. Um, and again, it depends what panel you have, if you have testing for those Lynch syndrome genes or not. Well, I know I have to look at my report, but uh, the uh, lady that your equivalent uh, mm -hmm. mentioned um, that they test a different type of cancers and I had to pay for it because I gave provided with all the information. She said, you're not going to be, you probably won't be positive. You're going to have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I, I had to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. And, she, and it was $250. Was it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Chrissy, there's a question about um, renal and kidney cancers. Are they at all related to breast cancers? So that's another group of genes too. So I would say there's not a gene that specifically comes off the top of my head with, with breast and renal, but things to look for for genes um, that are associated with renal cancer would be if it's on, if it's multifocal. So if it's on multiple spots on the kidney can be a higher chance that there's a mutation. And again, these are genes other than BRCA1 and 2 and the breast cancer genes that I talked about, um, or if it's bilateral, if it was on both kidneys, that's another reason to pursue genetic testing. So um, because we say things, you know, the odds of something affecting one side of the body could just be by chance. The odds of something affecting both sides of the body, we think maybe there's something genetics that's causing both sides of the body to have cancer. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Linda, you have another question? I do. I do. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I just, this is making me think. So my genetic testing was negative. Mm -hmm. um, I had was diagnosed with the triple negative and the LCIS. My mom had breast cancer, it was DCIS, when she was probably 72, 75 years old. Um, and she, due to her age, just had, um, uh, gosh, she just had a lumpectomy actually. And she's never had a recurrence. She stopped screening. She's in her 90s now. Do you think it would warrant getting some genetic testing by her? I have two daughters. If again, if your neg if your testing was negative, there's nothing you can pass yeah. on to your kids. So again, okay. testing for your mom would just be more for her knowledge. It sounds like. Um, okay. Okay. What about my husband's mother who had breast cancer? Still the same same thing. Because, yeah. Yeah. Right, and that's so. The reason I'm hesitating with a lot of these who should get tested because it, it does depend on, that's why we take that whole family history because there can be a lot of factors that, that make us recommend sure. testing or not. So I definitely, you know, try to gather as much family history, find out what those ages of diagnosis are. I think anyone that's had cancer, if they want testing, should pursue it, I guess is my short answer to a lot of these questions. Um, but from a sure. criteria testing, you know, if she was at an older age and there's no other family history of breast cancer, I want to be as concerned that there's a mutation. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
We've got about three more minutes. Does anybody have other questions? Please feel free to put them in the chat or if you feel comfortable speaking up, um, please go ahead. I'll put my email, I'll keep this other slide up for the next three minutes. <coughs> questions yeah well i just have a comment it's not really a question but i don't want to take you're fine judy go ahead <laughs> i'm looking at the scroll going through where they're writing it down i guess as you speak and i the word should for me they type s-h-i-t <laughs> <laughs> oh no are there any proof reading this before <laughs> Where did so, I type that? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's like, what? <laughs> just, a, just a comment. So it sounds like when I'm thinking about the genetic testing, it sounds like uh, if you had the test done like recently, in my case, it's 2021, you are suggesting that maybe every two years probably could retest or not retest, but if you had one of those uncertain results, just to reach out to your genetic counselor and see if it's, if that uncertain result has been reclassified, but not necessarily, you know, getting your blood drawn and doing this testing again every two years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But maybe just reach out and see if there's any additional information. Well, this has been very informative because yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like reassurance for my, you know, my past history. Mm -hmm. And the decisions that were made, I thought was, okay, I could see why <laughs> my yeah. doctor recommended certain things and didn't recommend it others. So. Right. And genetics is mm -hmm. just one piece of the puzzle that we say. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of other considerations that go into what treatment, what surgery, what, yeah. All right. Does anybody have any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chrissy, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time and for providing us with all of this information. I mean, you know, it just, it just, there's so many different factors at play <laughs> to show that um, cancer is so complicated and, you know, so, so many things are behind it, but thank you so much for taking your time um, to speak with us and for the thoughtful presentation and for answering all of our questions. And we certainly hope to have you back sometime. I had I, it was a privilege to talk to all of you. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks again. All right, everybody have a great night. We'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.